Okay. Let's see what was. Okay, so let's uh, wrap up the lecture on the rise of dinosaurs so that we could start fresh on Friday with the Ornithischian dinosaurs. So we've been exploring the base of the dinosaur radiation in the context of this world in which they were not the dominant forms. So this is a figure showing geologic time from earlier to younger in rocks on uh, in South America, and we're seeing the different groups of animals. And it's the ones in this dark, you know, it's a very dark blue, whatever color it is, those are dinosaurs. Um, here are some Silosaurids, so these are other, and over here, these are Pseudosuchians, so these are other archosaurs, and these are in pink Therapsids. And it shows you that, you know, the dinosaurs are not the dominant parts of this community, that um, in the earliest days of the dinosaurs, of course, they're very rare, and other groups are more important. And even by the late Triassic, you're getting some bigger carnivorous dinosaur thera uh, car uh, some bigger carnivorous dinosaurs in the theropod group. We're getting some big herbivores in the sauropodomorph group, but it was still a world largely dominated by pseudosuchians. Here we are at the very end of the Triassic, and we've got an early sauropod, an early long, uh, the big long-necked plant eaters. But it's getting munched on not by a carnivorous dinosaur, but by a protocroc, a pseudosuchian. Well, how did it go from a world dominated by pseudosuchians to one dominated by, um, by dinosaurs? Well, part of the reign of the dinosaurs seems to have begun with, of all things, rain. There is a two million year interval from about uh, 232 to uh, two th of 234 to 232 million years ago, in which the sedimentary rocks around the world, both terrestrial and the marine one, show a big influx of fresh water, and that's in the form of rain. And the communities of animals before and after are rather different. Um, before we have a wide, oh, here's a, down here is this interval of this transition. Uh, it's called, by the way, the Carnian pluvial event. Carnian refers to the, ep uh, sorry, the, the age within the late Triassic epoch in which this takes place. Pluvial means rain. And prior to it, we have a lot of mid-sized therapsids and uh, various sorts of reptilian herbivores um, that are in the same general ecological status as the early herbivorous dinosaurs. So some of these uh, non-archosaurian reptiles and some of the small, small to mid-sized therapsids and so forth are at least as common, if not more common, than these small, long-necked, plant-eating dinosaurs. But after this extended period of rain, which seems to have been triggered by volcanism, although the exact mechanics of that aren't all worked out, we get in the later part of the late Triassic dinosaurs in the form of sauropodomorphs being by far the most common large herbivore. Now, as we'll talk about when we talk about this group later on, these were extremely well suited to feeding higher up in the trees than any other sort of, um, of herbivore at that time. Um, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about the origin of the sauropodomorphs. But even after this Carnian pluvial event, it's still a Pseudosuchian dominated world for the rest of the ecology, for the carnivores, for the armored herbivores, and so forth. Uh, by the way, I should point out that the Carnian pluvial event is not well documented in either the trace fossil or the body fossil records of North America, either Eastern North America or Western North America, where we actually have a, a good record in both regions. But in the rest of the world, it seems to take place. The real transition from a Pseudosuchian dominated world to a dinosaur dominated one happens at the very end of the Triassic. So throughout the late Triassic was when dinosaurs shared the earth. And we have lots of therapsids, both small, medium, and large. We have lots of Pseudosuchians, many different lifestyles, herbivores, fast running small carnivores, semi aquatic fish eaters, terrestrial carnivores, terrestrial herbivores as well as a number of types of dinosauromorphs. But then, as the Triassic changes into the Jurassic, we lose all but the tiniest therapsids. In fact, what we lose is everything but mammals and their closest relatives. We lose all the Pseudosuchians, 
except for the direct ancestors of crocodilians, which were small-bodied animals. And we lose some groups within dinosaurs and their cousins, but the majority of dinosaur groups survive. So what happens? This is actually a major extinction event. It's one of the five biggest extinction events in the history of life. We saw how the Permo-Triassic extinction, the one between the Permian period and the Triassic at 252, the greatest mass extinction of all time, set up an age of reptiles that was actually dominated by Pseudosuchians. And this new event at the end of the Triassic, so between the Triassic and the Jurassic, at about 201 million years ago, separates the world of the Pseudosuchians over here with the world of dinosaurs. Now, much like the Permo-Triassic extinction, this one is also triggered by a huge flood basalt volcanic episode, but one that's much closer to us physically in space, as well as 50 million years closer in time. The volcanics involved here are what are called CAMP, or the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. It is the largest flood basalt event since the Siberian Traps. It's almost as big, not quite as big, almost as big. And it's associated with the breaking apart of Pangaea along this axis here, between North America, Greenland, Europe, and Asia on one side, and South America and Africa on the other. So it opens up what we call the Central Atlantic region. And in fact, we see rocks associated with this up and down the what we call the I-95 corridor along eastern North America. Whenever you see reddish rocks when you're driving up near I-95, whether you're going from the Carolinas all the way up to Nova Scotia, those are rocks associated with this rip-up event as Pangaea tore itself apart. And like the, uh, like the event at the end of the Permian, there's a huge amount of greenhouse gases, mostly in the form of carbon dioxide, that are released. So we can see uh, sedimentary rocks that are forming in basins, uh, formed as Pangaea is pulling apart. So it's tearing apart, and actually, and I refer to these as the stretch marks of the birth of the Atlantic, which is, you know, maybe a little vulgar, but it gets the point across. These exist all up and down the eastern seaboard of North America, and actually, they exist in South America and over in. Uh, North Africa as well, uh, representing a rift valley forming. And the biggest of these is still moving today. It's the Atlantic Ocean. We also get volcanic rocks and very shallow plutonic rocks, like the Palisades of New Jersey and uh, along the Hudson Valley. Collectively, all these bodies of rock are called the Newark Supergroup. And they represent the extension, the pulling apart that's going on in North America as Pangaea is forming. And there's equivalent supergroups in northern South America and over in northern Africa as this event happens and Pangaea pulls itself apart. So here's a map at the beginning of this event, so about 10 million years before the, uh, the Jurassic. And we see these basins forming, tearing apart, getting lake deposits and so forth in there. And over the course, here we are getting into the early Jurassic. Over the course of this time, this event rips Pangaea apart. Well, all those greenhouse warming gases, mostly CO2 coming up, causes essentially the same types of phenomena we saw with the Permo-Triassic extinction. Extreme global warming, reduced oxygen at sea level, reduced oxygen in the ocean, ocean acidification. And in this really stressed out world, many groups die, including many of the Pseudosuchian groups. So those would be the major rivals of the dinosaurs, as well as many Therapsid groups. There are other groups involved as well, but they're outside the scope of this course, various types of shellfish, for instance. And much like the event at the Permo-Triassic, it looks like there was enough sulfur gases that were released initially with the eruption that it act this whole event started with a great period of cooling. So a, an intense period of, of a cold event, so a mini but intense glaciation phase, followed by a super global warming phase. In fact, a lot of the great mass extinctions look like they've got to have at least a one-two punch of extremes of environment in order to be as extensive as they are. Towards the end of the course, when we talk about the extinction at the end of the age of dinosaurs, we'll see that there is, again, in that one, both extensive warming and extensive cooling and extensive warming again involved with it. 
And so with this extinction, by circumstance, the dinosaurs were left without real rivals. The last of the Pseudosuchians, uh, the only Pseudosuchian group to survive this event, were the direct ancestors of crocodilians, the fast-running fox-sized forms, and slightly more heavily built armored forms. These are even closer to the ancestors of modern crocodiles. But these are only about 1 to 2 feet long, 30 to 60 centimeters. There would be giant crocodiles in the age of dinosaurs, but that's tens of millions of years from now. So these are not competitors for the early dinosaurs. In fact, in some cases, they would be food for early dinosaurs. And the therapsids to survive were early mammals. They were generally quite small, most of them only in the 5 to 10 centimeters. That's um, 2 to 4 inches long range. There were a few larger ones, but not tremendously larger. Uh, and so again, they're not really rivals to the dinosaurs. So the earliest Jurassic dinosaurs, they look to their left, they look to their right. There's no real competition. And so they realized that from the early Jurassic until, as we'll see, at the end of the uh, Cretaceous, this was when dinosaurs ruled the Earth. And so starting on Friday's lecture, we'll work from the base of the dinosaur family tree and then march up step by step the different branches and explore their diversification, their adaptations, their way of life for the middle part of this course, which is going to focus on dinosaurian diversity. Take care and see you in class on Friday.